We have a wonderful night plan for you guys. This is your last lecture. Um, this event was put on through the General Alumni Association. Whether you know it or not, through our four years, the GAA has run so many awesome events for us, and they wanted to make sure that tonight was no different, that they sent us off in a very special way. So, sit back, relax, be emotional if you want to, and get ready to hear from an amazing lecturer and just reminisce about our four years, all right? So tonight, um, I have the wonderful opportunity. Oh wait, let me introduce myself first and foremost, right? <laughs> hey guys, my name is Alexis White. I'm the senior class vice president, um, and I'm going to introduce our lecturer for tonight. So Dr. Matthew Andrews was born in Oakland, California, and he grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area. He attended UCLA as an undergraduate, where he majored in history. Well, sort of, and he's going to tell you a little more about that. After working a series of odd jobs, he'll also tell you more about those jobs, he returned to school and earned his master's degree in history from San Francisco State University and his PhD in American history here at UNC Chapel Hill in 2008. He has taught at Duke University, NC State, and Guilford College, but for the last three years, he has taught only at UNC where he serves as the lecturer and advisor for the Department of History a position he says he loves. Dr. Andrew teaches courses in global and American history with a special interest in the links between sports, politics, and the history of the United States. So, 2015, let's give Dr. Andrews a warm round of applause. Hello, how are you? How, how's the volume? Okay, you can hear good, good. Um, it's true, I, I do teach courses on uh, sports and American history. I would tell you what those courses are, but you are not taking courses anymore. You are all done, so congratulations. Um, I want to thank you for taking the time to come here and to listen to one last lecture. I've been talking to a few of you. I'm getting a sense that there's going to be a party later. I'm sort of thinking of myself as your speed bump on the way to the party later. Um, some of you have told me you're heading out for a, for a bar crawl. Um, I've heard tell of senior bar golf. Uh, I don't know what bar golf is, but I am a sport historian, so I'm intellectually curious about this. Uh, it sounds like some sort of competition where you go from bar to bar and you try to compete tasks for points, like getting the whole crowd to sing God Bless America or make out with three strangers all at the same time. Is that pretty much, yeah, that would be a double eagle. I, I, so, um, Anyway, that's what it sounds like. I've never participated in something so perverse by myself. <laughs> anyway, um, be fun, have safe, as the saying goes. Um, let me start by saying, being serious for a second here, um, start by saying how truly honored I am to have been asked to, to do this. Um, I am honored to be representing the faculty here at UNC. I am honored to be representing the history department and my, my colleagues there. Uh, let me be clear though, I do not speak for the entire faculty uh, this, this evening. I don't want to weigh them down with the burden of some of the uh, bad jokes I'll be, be making. Um, many among the faculty are very, very serious people. Um, I am not terribly serious. I'm going to be a little bit irreverent this, this evening. So. Um, most of all, I'm really honored, let me see if I can get this thing going. There we go. Um, most of all, I'm really honored just to be part of this last lecture series. You may or may not know the origin of the last lecture idea. I remember when this happened. Um, it was a tradition that suddenly got a lot of attention in 2007 when Randy Posh, a professor at Carnegie Mellon University, gave what was literally his last lecture. Uh, Dr. Pausch was dying of cancer, and he seized the opportunity to give one last talk to friends, to colleagues, um, to discuss what he had accomplished. <laughs> Am I... It's not my fault. <laughs> going? Not talking? Okay. Good, good. Yeah, okay. Uh, Dr. Pausch was, um, again, he was discussing his life, he was discussing his accomplishments, he was giving advice, he was reflecting. Can you still hear me? I can't tell. All right. Um, it caused quite a sensation in 2007. I remember watching this on YouTube when it, when it happened. 
I was so moved by this incredibly poised speech by a man who was saying goodbye to his friends, saying goodbye to his colleagues, was soon going to have to say goodbye to his wife and, and, and children. It was inspiring. It was heartbreaking. So I'm very honored just to be doing something in the tradition of, of Dr. Pausch. Um, it was last year when I first learned that UNC did something similar, that we have our own last lecture series. Uh, it was Dr. Lois, Lois Boyton from the Journalism School. Any J School people out there? Good to be trying to be cool. Um, <laughs> Dr. Boyton herself, she's wonderful. I've met her once. Uh, she had a few years earlier herself been diagnosed with cancer, and she was on the full road to re recovery. She talked about how the campus and her students provided the energy for her, kind of really helped her through this difficult time. So knowing about Dr. Pouch's and Dr. Boynton's lectures, when I received the email from your class president, Sasha, there, and I'm not trying to be tasteless at all, literally my first thought was, oh my god, what does Sasha know um, about my health that I did not know? Um, I am uh, pleased to report that I, I believe I am healthy. Um, Sasha has assured me you have no inside information whatsoever. All right. Um, he told me that I had been selected as the individual that you wanted to hear speak. And again, I'm absolutely honored to be, to be doing this. So the question that has been vexing me all week is, well, what should I talk about? And part of the problem was my confusion about what the last lecture is supposed to be. And so I'm a historian, so I did a little research about the last lecture, and I have found conflicting information. I have learned that some people say this is supposed to be your last lecture. I'm supposed to think of it as exactly that. You are hearing one last lecture before you hop on that magic carpet that is your diploma. And I'm going to stop right there. That's, that's pretty ridiculous. Um, other sources suggested that what I'm supposed to do, I'm supposed to imagine that this is my last lecture. And I'm supposed to figure out if I was truly giving one last lecture, what would I talk about? Um, now, this is intriguing, because then I can talk about anything that I wanted. Let me think of the possibilities that are out there. There are a lot of things I've always wanted to, to say. But here's where I have to remember that this is actually just a simulated last lecture. I have to go back to work tomorrow morning. I like this job. I need this job. So this is not an anything goes uh, evening. So here's what I have decided. I do not present myself as the world's best teacher or as an example that all professors should try to emulate, but I do think that I have figured out something very important about teaching over the years. And so if you yourself are going into the teaching profession, I hope some of you are, here's something that I think you need to remember. When you are a teacher, you always need to keep one thing in mind. When you get right down to it, you are not teaching a subject, you are teaching people. That's what you always need to remember, you're teaching people. I don't care if your PhD is in molecular biology, international economics, or American history. When you walk into a classroom, yes, you are discussing facts and theories and ideas, but you are discussing those things and relaying that information to people. This means you have to try to relate to them. You have to know your audience. You have to think a little bit, perhaps, about what they want to hear. You have to connect with the students. I like to think that I do a pretty good job of that. Um, I read what some of you write about me on that ultimate oracle of truth, ratemyprofessor.com. Um, you have asked me to speak here tonight. In my mind, this is a sign that I am doing something somewhat right. So, here's what I'm thinking about this evening. This is your classroom. Um, I am a visitor here. And let me say this, you have an awesome classroom. This is a very cool setting. The lights, I think I actually saw a champagne bottle um, in the back. I won't reveal who that, that was. Um, so, as I think about what to say tonight, I have to think about who you are. Who are you as a group? And as opposed to most classes, when everyone in my group is a student of American history, or if you're a molecular biologist, everyone in your class is interested in molecular biology, you don't have those shared interests. What binds you all together is that you have successfully navigated through at least four years at UNC. Um, you are about to embark on a new phase in your life. And make no mistake, 
you're about to experience a pretty abrupt transition. Um, a transition from college to what we call the real world. And it's not the greatest or most abrupt transition you will experience in your life. If you ever have children, that is an abrupt and brutal transition. <laughs> um, but the transition that you are on the cusp of is pretty abrupt too. Uh, this transition is not abrupt because life is about to get harder. I don't want to suggest that. College is hard. College is plenty hard. Um, it can be stressful. It's one big series of tests. I see many of you in my classes. I want to remind you, you still have exams coming up. <laughs> but what's different about this next phase, this is a phase that commences in what? Nine days for you, I guess? You'll wake up on a couple Mondays from now and you'll be college graduates. What's different about this phase is that now you have arrived at the part of your life where you really need to figure things out. It really is up to you now where you go from this point forward. And I realize I'm not speaking for everyone here, but for many of you, I suspect going to a university was always part of the plan. It was the expectations that your parents put on you, the expectation that your teachers put on you, your community. That's a fine expectation to have. Universities can be wonderful places. I'm placing the exact same expectation on my daughter right now. Um, but there has been a roadmap for you to an extent. And so when I think back, it was 25 years ago when I graduated from college, when I think back to that day when I graduated from college, I remember realizing this is where the roadmap ends. You know, it's all kind of been laid out for me, and now where am I going to, to go? And so what I thought I would do is sort of present myself as a wise old sage. Um, I'm going to get all Dr. Phil on you for a couple of minutes, and I'm going to give you some advice. Um, I have decided that the purpose of this lecture is for me to provide some words of wisdom as you go forth. So here they come. Uh, remember, you asked me to come here, so technically you asked for it. Um, so here's what I have to, have to say. Uh, all right. When I came to the conclusion that I needed to give you some advice, I wasn't exactly sure what I wanted to tell you, so I thought about it, and I realized, oh, I'll do what every mature adult does. I went immediately to Facebook and I pounded out a message to my friends and I said, help, I'm giving this lecture, I have no idea what to say. What should I tell people? Um, I'm going to be talking to a bunch of people, they're all, they've given me this tremendous honor, they've asked me to come and speak tonight. Um, what type of advice do you wish you would have been given when you graduated from college? And uh, I got a lot of responses. I was very proud of myself, the most responses I've ever had on, on, on Facebook. And um, I'm going to share some of my friend's advice. Um, then I'll give you some of my own. So I have some actual words. These are actual words from actual people. These are my actual friends. Um, though it will not seem like it at times, they are actual grown-ups. Um, some of them, they have jobs, they have kids, they have PhDs. Um, when possible, I have paired their words with images for those of you who are more inclined about learning visually. So here come some words of advice for me and my Facebook friends. <laughs> some of the advice comes in the form of warnings, things not to do. So um, actual piece of advice number one is don't shave your back, it only grows in your finger. <laughs> Do they make razors like that? <laughs> this is very specific advice, but I think we can all learn something here. Um, if you are a visual learner, I should have included like a big red arrow with a line through it. You're not supposed to shave your back. That's what, what the, the point is here. Um, those of you who have taken classes with me know that I also like to stop and ask if there are questions. Can I clarify anything? Um, okay. Actual piece of advice number two. This one may come in handy later this evening. Never drink <laughs> Jägermeister, no matter how good an idea it may seem. If you have a pen right now and you're going out later, write this down on the back of your hand. All right, it may, it may save you. That's actually Rory McElroy if you're a, a golfer. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 
some of the life advice my friends thought you should know address this idea of, of crossroads. Um, those critical life moments, you know, when life comes down to a choice. Should I take this road or should I take that road? Um, my friend Montgomery, who teaches at the University of, of Georgia, her suggestion is, is this. Um, all we, where, where do I go here? Yeah, um, when in doubt, choose live music over studying, working, uh, working on a presentation. Montgomery wants you to know, and I endorse this message, that you have to have fun. The work is always going to be there. It's a cliche, but no one ever said on their, their deathbed that they wish they had put in more hours at, at the office. Um, go out, have fun, start tonight. Um, <laughs> the work can usually wait. Similar to this, uh, we have advice from my, friends, my friend Hans. Hans is a crazy guy. A couple of years ago, Hans surprised all of us. He packed up all of this stuff. He moved to Beirut, Lebanon, where he now teaches philosophy at a university there. Uh, Hans said this, when you are facing a big life decision, like whether or not I should stick my tongue on a pole, um, ask yourself, which of these options is more, like me to, is more likely to give me a really good story when I'm older, and then pick that option. <laughs> In other words, don't be afraid to be daring. Um, take risks. Now the problem with this advice is it directly contradicts the don't drink Jägermeister advice. <laughs> I cannot tell you how many great stories I have heard over the years to start with, so we were all drinking Jägermeister, <laughs> and so on and so forth. Anyway, I'll leave this up to you. You'll have to navigate your, your, your own way here. So let me say this, let me switch gears here and move away from the excellent advice that came from the Facebook um, to a couple of suggestions that I feel like I absolutely have to make, otherwise I would feel as if I missed a tremendous opportunity. There are a lot of you here, this is so great. Um, one of the suggestions I want to make has to do with your future career, and the other has to do with the type of person you are going to be outside of the workplace. So let me start by talking about jobs. You may not know this, but now is when you're supposed to get a job. Um, this is when it starts. So you will be asked many times in the next couple of weeks by family members, so now what are you going to do? And when they ask you that, they're not interested in whether you're going rock climbing in a couple of weeks or whether where you're gonna go for, for dinner. They want to know how are you going to pay Bills. We all have to have jobs. So let me ask you a question. I'm just curious, and I suspect I know what's going to happen here. How many of you have the job that you know you're going to want for the rest of your life? That you've got a job coming up and you are all set? I see one, two, two hands, two hands. Okay. Um, those of you who raised your hand, both of you, I salute you. Um, I had no idea what I wanted to do when I graduated from college, none whatsoever. So those of you who did not raise your hand, I'm not gonna ask you to raise your hand if you don't have a job, but I suspect many of you don't have jobs. But those of you who did not raise your hand, I wanna show you and tell you one very important thing. You are not alone. I am here to tell you that it is totally okay if you have no idea what you wanna do rest of your life. You may think that everybody else has their life plan, perfectly planned, but this is not true. I think this is one of the myths of a liberal education, a type of education that you have earned here at UNC. The idea is this myth that we come to this place like UNC, you are exposed to all of these different courses through the demands of the general education requirements. Um, anyone who doesn't figure out exactly what they want to do in the time they have spent here it just isn't paying attention. That is not true. In fact, part of me thinks coming out of here not knowing what you want to do suggests perhaps that you really have been paying attention. Now you may have figured out what you want to do, and again, that's great if you have, um, but so many of the happy and successful people that I know my age, in their mid-40s, they did not know what they wanted to do when they were 22. Many of them did not know what they wanted to do when they were 32. 
So for example, let me tell you a quick story about someone who had zero idea about what he wanted to do when he graduated from, from college. This is the story of me. Um, and let me say this, I do not offer this story of me as evidence of this amazing success story, if you can only follow in my, my, my footprints, um, footsteps. Though it is the story of someone who over time trial and error, keeping his eyes and ears open, figured out what he wanted to do, and now has a job that he absolutely loves. So this is my way of telling you that you are not alone. All right, I sort of shudder about this. <laughs> this is me at 22 years old. Um, at age 22, I was pursuing the endless summer. Um, I basically tried to make a career of roaming Southern California beach towns, beaches in cheap Caribbean islands. It turns out it's very difficult to make a living um, doing exactly that. And I mean, please, a moment of silence. For <laughs> that is remarkable. Um, for both me and my hair, um, the jobs came and went after college. Um, I was an assistant kindergarten teacher for a couple of years. Um, that was cool for a while, and then that movie Kindergarten Cop came out, and everyone started calling me Kindergarten Cop, which didn't make any sense. It really bothered me. Um, I was one of those guys at rock concerts who wore the, the yellow jacket that said, Staff, we have to keep you off of the stage, young people such as your, yourself. Um, I held various office jobs, some of them dreadfully boring. This is something you should know right now. Some of the jobs you are going to have are going to suck. They are going to be awful. Um, that's okay. You have to have a job. Um, you don't have to stay in those jobs, but it's good to get paid. During this time, I became uh, when I was doing all of these different jobs, I became aware that I was getting more and more interested in American politics. Um, and so I decided I should probably go back to school. I should go back to school. I should study politics. Um, and here's the truth, and I'll be honest here. I, there was no way I could get into any graduate school that I wanted to get into um, when I first wanted to reapply. I went to UCLA. And as the hair suggests, I spent much more time experiencing the city of Los Angeles than I did experiencing my university. Um, so I went to the history office at the nearest college to me. This was San Francisco State University. And I asked, I begged, can you please let me into your master's program? And they said, no, sorry. Um, they said, we'll take your money, though. Um, and you can take a couple of classes and you'll be on probation. And if you do well enough, we'll let you stay in the master's program. So this is as good as a deal as I could, could get. Um, I was working 40 hours a week in one of those sucky jobs. I was going to night school and I started trying and suddenly I started doing very well in school and I was getting more interested in American history and American politics, what I was studying. I got into the master's program, um, but I still didn't really know what I wanted to do. I was in school, that seemed good enough. Was I gonna go teach? Was I gonna teach high school? Was I gonna be a journalist? What was it that I really was interested in? And then one day I met a guy who taught history and told me that he was teaching a course on the history of baseball. He was gonna use baseball to look at the big issues in American history. Now, I have always had a fascination with sport. Um, I had a growing interest in the links between sports and politics in the United States at this time, and so I asked, I said, can you do that? And he said, yeah, I said, I wrote a book on Jackie Robinson, and I'm a sport historian. And once again, I said, you can do that. Um, and right then and there is when the light went off and I realized that is what I want to do. This is exactly what I want to do for the foreseeable future, perhaps for the rest of my, my life. I was 30 years old. Most of you, you cannot even imagine 30. 30 probably seems so far away and really that's my point. It can take a while. Um, that's okay. You're going to be okay. 
Um, my friends who knew me back in college, um, when they found out that I got a PhD and I taught at a school like UNC, they thought that was the funniest thing they ever heard in their entire life. Um, and I kind of agree to an extent. When I was a college student, I never would have imagined, never would have imagined I would be teaching at a college. I never would have imagined I would love being a college professor. Um, all of this is to suggest that you probably can't even imagine what it is that you're going to, to find. All you can do is go out there, try different things. Again, keep your eyes open, see what's out there. You know, I'm not suggesting the sort of lazy beachcomber to PhD tra trajectory. That is not for, for, for everyone. Um, but again, if you don't know where you are going, it's okay. What do they say in that um, joke? Um, clear eyes, pure heart, can't lose. Yeah, that's what I want to say to you. Yeah, right. The second thing that I want to make sure that I say tonight is to address you not as future working men or future working women, but as citizens. You may not want to hear it, but I could not forgive myself if I did not spend a few minutes saying the following. You are soon to be graduates of UNC. This is one of the greatest schools in the world. You are what we like to call the best and the brightest. And I have met plenty of you to know how incredibly bright you are. I have met plenty of you to know how incredibly generous and genius hearted you, you, you are. Um, what I want you to know is that I think you have an obligation. Um, I want you to know that the world needs you. Um, I realize I'm asking a lot here, but I'm going to move beyond giving advice and I'm going to ask for your help. Um, I'm not going to ask you to support this cause or that cause. I have many interests, but I'm not going to ask you to align with any of these particular causes. But I am going to ask you to really consider using your education that you have gained here for good, um, to help others, to get involved in some sort of struggle, to stand up and be counted. Um, this is infinitely more easy, actually, than finding your dream job. All you have to do is figure out what bothers you and then show up someday and try to fix it. And as an example, on your last day on campus, I want to remind you of one of your fellow Tar Heels, someone who did exactly that, someone who stood up and was counted and that's Coach Smith. It would be impossible not to know that Dean Smith passed away in February of this, this year. I never got to meet Coach Smith, um, but as a member of the UNC community and as someone who's very interested in the links between sports and politics, I feel like I can speak a, with a little bit of authority here. Um, most people know what a tremendous basketball coach Dean Smith was to national championships uh, when he retired the most Division I wins for a men's program in, in history. Um, for his players, he was a coach, he was a mentor, he was like a father figure. It was Coach Smith who put his particular principles into practice when he signed the first black basketball player here, Charles Scott. Um, a cynic might say that what Coach Smith was doing was just trying to improve his basketball team, that he was really in it for the, the wins. In my sport history courses, we explore all of the reasons for desegregation, and sometimes those are the reasons. Sometimes it is economic, sometimes it is a desire for, for wins that have caused programs and coaches to do the right thing. Um, but here is where I think the cynics are wrong about Dean Smith. And I don't know how much you know about Dean Smith, but Dean Smith was someone who stood up and was willing to be counted almost every day of his adult life. Um, though he was a prominent public figure, indeed he was the face of this university for many years, 
he did not shy away from taking controversial stands if he believed in those issues. Lost in most of the remembrances about Dean Smith, as people talk about him as a coach, as people talk about his role in the desegregation process, is, well, a couple of things. First of all, never forget how unpopular it was when Dean Smith decided to desegregate the basketball program. It was immensely unpopular among many people in this state. But more than that, Dean Smith was an avid opponent of the death penalty. And I'm not telling you that you need to subscribe to his belief. Um, I hope what you do is you have a clear, critical mind about this and that you look at the issue and like Dean Smith, you come up with some sort of opinion based on your own critical analysis. Dean Smith did this and he decided that he believed that the death penalty was wrong. He did this even though 80% of Americans uh, believed that the death penalty was right. He did this even though the death penalty was a bipartisan idea in this state. He believed it was wrong, and so he spoke out about it. Coach Smith spoke out, uh, spoke out about the Vietnam War. He opposed nuclear weapons proliferation. He supported LGBT rights. Um, he and his wife, Anne, they dedicated their lives to illuminating the problem of, of sex trafficking in the United States and trying to stop those problems. Again, allow me to emphasize this. I promise I'm not trying to sway you or make you lean over to one political idea here, but I am encouraging you to stand up at some point in your life to figure out something that really bothers you and to try to do something about it. Sometimes you will be spontaneously confronted with a problem. Sometimes you will be spontaneously confronted with meanness. Um, I think of all the times I've been out with friends and someone has said something really mean about my friends or about a group of people. When someone says something mean to you, you need to punch that person in the face. <laughs> and I mean that metaphorically, of, of course. I mean, use your words. Unless you're really big, like Sasha, then use your fists, by all means. Absolutely, use your, use your fists. But when mean people need to be told they are being mean. But beyond sort of responding to these spontaneous moments, every cause needs good-hearted soldiers. Again, I know you all. There are so many good-hearted people out there. As you're trying to figure out what it is you want to do, what it is you want to do with your life, please don't forget the rest of the world. That said, let me also mention this. How am I doing? As you go out into the world and you are confronted by mean people and you discover many of the problems that exist out there, don't be overwhelmed by them. Don't let them drag you down. Um, I'm going to quote one of my friends again. Um, her name is Bethany, and Bethany calls herself a professor, but Bethany is really a poet. Bethany put it like, like this. Keep your childlike wonder. There are a lot of awful things in the world and you should not be blind to them. But your ability to see the joy and beauty in the world is what will give you the hope to face them and the belief that it is possible to change them. It can be so overwhelming sometimes. It's so easy to be so overwhelmed by all of the problems that are out there if you really start paying attention. Don't lose sight of the beauty in your life. Don't lose sight of all of the wonderful things in your life. That doesn't do anyone any good. Um, I really like this sentiment from, from Bethany. Um, I think she has expressed it beautifully here. Um, of course, what Bethany did in the next line sort of undid a lot of the emotional power. She had to add this last line on. Um, and when all else fails, Uranus jokes. <laughs> Seriously, even at 46, Uranus jokes are always funny. Impressive. Impressive. So, um, I'm going to start to wind down. Is that about, about right? Doing 
doing good here? I can't see any of my, my notes. Um, <laughs> let me make uh, one more request. Remember us here at, at UNC. You're going to go off. Don't forget us about. Uh, don't forget about us. Don't forget about the professors here. We are interested in you. Send us emails. I like nothing more hearing about from, hearing from my students, hearing about the challenges they have faced, the successes they have achieved. I love it when students come back and spontaneously drop into my office. I like going to top of the hill with my students and and having a beer. Um, don't forget where you are from. You are from many places, but you are definitely from Chapel Hill, and never forget that. Uh, I'm reminded of a student, a student who went to school close to here. It wasn't Chapel Hill. It was at that small Methodist school down the road. I believe it's called Duke. Um, they had a student there a few decades back. His name was Richard Nixon. Maybe you've heard of him. Richard Nixon. And when he graduated from Duke, he said the, the following. I always remember that whatever I have done in the past or may do in the future, Duke University is responsible for that. That's not the applause, yeah. Um, this is a quote that all Tar Heels should know. Um, I'm pretty sure you will you know, uh, do your alma mater proud. So let me end by saying this. Um, I'll get an image up here for what you're about to experience. Yeah, that's gonna be a lot of fun. This may be your last lecture, but there really is no finality here. This really is the, the start for you all. Um, I'd like to give you one last piece of advice, if I could. You are about to have a wonderful couple of weeks end of finals, end of classes, parties and graduation, Jaeger shots and back shavings. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> just, just checking. Please remember to set aside some time for your parents um, in the coming week. Um, your parents, if they're coming here to see you graduate, they want to spend a little bit of time with you. Um, I know parents can be bothersome. I'm a parent. I tried to get my 12-year-old daughter, Ellie, to come here this evening, and she literally said, why would I want to hear you lecture? You lecture me all the time. <laughs> no, that's true. Um, and then, literally, she said, I would rather die than hear you speak for a <laughs> She loves me. Um, but remember this about your parents. Your parents brought you into this world. Your parents changed your diapers. Your parents made sure you got enough sleep. Um, they put up with your terrible twos. They put up with, I'm guessing, where you're even more terrible teenage years. Some of you are nodding. I think this is true. Um, include them in this weekend. One day, you may be in their shoes. One day, you may be watching your child graduate and that day is going to fill you with unbelievable pride. It is going to fill you with so many emotions that you all sitting here in front of me, you can't possibly imagine right now. So do right by your parents. And one parent is saying this. Um, thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for letting me share this evening with you. I wish all of you all the best.
I would now like to present him with the uh, Class of 2015 <laughs> Last Lecture Award. <laughs> It is now my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, uh, Dr. Michael Zalakoffer, a.k.a. Dr. Z. Um, so Dr. Z was born in Tarboro, North Carolina, and is a 1985 graduate of the UNC Medical School. Um, since his graduation from the medical school, Dr. Z has received a host of awards. Uh, people have literally just been throwing them at him. Um, and if I could read it in the spare light that I have, um, the UNC Medical School McDiver Award, the Davy Award, and most recently he was honored as the GAA's Harvey Beach Outstanding Alumni Award. Uh, Dr. Zalagoffer is the former chair of our UNC Board of Governors, uh, as well as a current member of the Jura Alumni Association Board of Directors. Uh, I actually had the pleasure of working with Dr. Z uh, on the GAA Board this year, and I can say with all sincerity that he is beyond a doubt uh, the most passionate energetic and exciting person to listen to hear speak, and I'm unbelievably excited that you guys get to listen to him today. Uh, Dr. Z is also the matching donor for our Class of 2015 class gift, um, so for any of you who donated $20.15 or more, um, Dr. Z actually matched your gift uh, up to $10,000 and just cares about you and seems so much to do that. So, uh, he actually postponed a golfing trip to come speak with everyone today. So uh, please give me a big hand and we welcome Dr. Michael Zalakoff. My goodness. <laughs> this is going to be a, 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 an exciting moment just to be in front of you all because I got a chance to go back to undergrad again. To be a part of the class of 2015 has been an experience. It's not because of me giving a challenge donation. It's just to be in the spirit of all of you. I don't know if you remember that video I did when you brought me up here to just try to do this thing. It was ad lib. I got in your face and so we're going to be number one. I don't want anything. I don't take second. One. Number one. Number one. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. But I want one of you to look to your right. I want one of you to look to your left. Two of you have not given me anything. <laughs> so I'm using this as a challenge to you to give me my 2015. 2015. 2015. So maybe the next time we just look to the right. I'll take that number. Now, since you're a great Cal uh, Carolina graduate, I know you can see what percentage of you have given. Just add it up. Two out of three. One out of two. You can do it. 2015. All right, we want 20, 50. I said I don't want to be second. I'm not going to chastise you about it all and push the point home. But I also want you to be up here as a, as a spokesman for the GAA that when you leave here, you no longer will be a student of this university. You'll be an alumni. Isn't that amazing? As an alumni, you ought to give again to the GAA. <laughs> I wish I'm a board member. As soon as I left here, I just had to be a part of this institution forever. I just cannot stop wanting to be a Tar Heel. So as soon as I got out, I became a life member. I want all of you to be life members of the GAA. That's who sponsors this stuff, who sponsors events on campus, who gives you a chance once you get off campus, like, like Sasha was going to Ireland, to be able to find somebody to help improve his long lost mission away from this country. The GAA will be there. We'll climb my Elvis for you, the GAA. <laughs> so don't forget 2015, left and right. Somebody didn't give me my money. But don't worry, we'll talk about it. I told you I wasn't going to hold you to that. But be a GAA member because it's what you give back to this institution. When you come back, you're not going to career services on campus. You're going to the alumni career service. Alumni, alumni. <laughs> now, you may wonder why that I give so much to the institution, that means so much to me. 
uh, Sasha was uh, saying a couple of things that I've done for the school. But really, the biggest thing that I want to leave you home is a message. So maybe if it gets into your heart that you understand what this university does and what it gives to you, what it's about. This is the finest institution, not in this country, but in this world. To be a Tar Heel, to be a Tar Heel. And let me tell you about one man's voice, because this is the story that got me here, that told me about it. There's this little country black kid who grew up in Littleton, North Carolina. It was back in the 30s. All you did was share crop, work laborious, hard jobs, with not much pay, not much thanks. But he had one special talent, this little kid. He was a child product, and this is a true story. He graduated from high school at 13 years old. He entered the university, or at that time, North Carolina A&T, at that 13-year-old age. He graduated from North Carolina A&T at 17. He's finished college at 17, and he wanted to be a doctor. So he entered or applied to medical school, he got into every medical school he applied to and rejected every one of them because it was not the medical school he wanted to go to. Remember, this is 1940, 1940. So he waited for one thing because he only wanted to be a Tar Heel. So he came and they rejected him. He came again, they rejected him. He came again, they rejected him. He came 10 years in a row. And on the 10th time, they accepted him. He became the fourth African American to go to the University of North Carolina Medical School. I became the first second generation to come here because that man was my dad. He wanted to be a Tar Heel. That's all. Not a doctor. Not anything else was more important than being a Tar Heel. It's not about your race. It's not about your this or that. It's not about the silent sand or the halls or this or that. It's about this institution that cares for folk and folk care to be here. This one little kid just wanted to go to that flagship university. It didn't mean anything about his profession. It meant to be a Tar Heel. That's what you're gonna be something now. You're graduating. You're gonna be a Tar Heel. That is a time when you can give back to people like that who had nothing but took and made something out of that nothing. So we just had the last lecture, but let that be your first lecture for the rest of your life. We talk about keeping that childlike innocence, the hopes and the dreams, when my dad kept that dream so he could be here and motivate a host of us to get here. I thank you for that. I hope you understand what I'm trying to put to you. We are Tar Heels. We need 2015. <laughs> and if you can't get it after that, then I think you've got another thing coming. Thank you for this <laughs> also not a back shaver. <laughs> uh, so once again, I have the uh, unfortunate responsibility of speaking after Dr. Z, who, as you can see, is very passionate um, and an excellent speaker. Uh, but I, I've, only got, I've only got a couple of things to say before, before we close it up. Um, first, I was, uh, I was reflecting on our, on our four years here. Uh, well, again, I'm, I'm sad it's coming to a close. I realized that I would not want to have attended UNC at any other time in its history because I would not have wanted to go gone to UNC with any other group of people. Now, I don't know all of you, but I do know a lot of you. Uh, and for the ones that I do know, it is both an honor and a pleasure to have known you and served you for the past four years. Uh, just to give you guys a quick little update on what the senior class has been up to, uh, our Life After UNC committee uh, has put together a series of financial workshops 
as well as dance lessons um, you could attend. Um, our Habitat for Humanity House, which was a class of 2015 service project, was dedicated last weekend. Um, our social, our senior campaign, um, which currently stands at, as Dr. Zhu was showing you the math, 33%, um, which is not where we want it to be, in terms of total dollar amount, um, has given the highest in UNC's history. Um, though we still want higher participation. Um, <laughs> and our social committee um, has been doing an outstanding job just bringing everyone from the class of 2015 together. Um, and as Dr. Andrew mentioned, we have another event tonight. Um, senior, actually just remembered, um, Senior Bargoff is not an officially GNA sanctioned event. <laughs> I didn't say that. Uh, but yes, there's a thing going on tonight. Uh, anyway, uh, but in order for all of this to have happened, um, it took a huge group of people who all worked really, really hard. Um, I would like to go ahead and thank them. Um, first and foremost is my my co-representative and vice president, Alexis White. Alexis, can you come up here? It says Vice President in front of Alexis's name and President in front of mine. Uh, this has been a co-presidency in every sense of the term. Um, she's phenomenal. Um, she does most of the work. Um, and I'm so fortunate I've had her. Uh, second, I'd like to thank our Chief Marshal, Glenn Bess, who could not be here tonight, but is phenomenally hardworking. Uh, and then third, I'd like to thank a group of people who do not get enough thanks, uh, but have been working so, so hard for the past 2015. Um, and that is our senior marshals. And if you're a senior marshal, if you could please stand up and come up to the front. Just to introduce everyone real briefly, um, this is Leslie, Maggie, Victor. He's a twin, Vincent's right next to him. Uh, Katrina, Kayla, Minoj, Chris, uh, Dustin, Catherine, Jordan, and Mary Liz. Um, and there's a bunch, bunch of others. Um, but I just wanted to say and have everyone recognize them and thank them for all the work that they've done. And now, to close out the speech, times in our undergraduate career, I'd like everyone to stand and sing our favorite song. <laughs>